Chapter 4.9.10 The first moonwalkers were not just explorers. They were the world's apex predators. The first earthen life to escape Earth and walk on the surface of another heavenly body were sapiens, Earth's peak predator. The population of sapiens which walked on the moon was the population which devoted itself to mastering the challenge of warfighting. Moonwalkers weren't just any sapiens. They were sapiens from the world's most powerful military nation who got there by riding the oversized versions of the nuclear intercontinental ballistic missiles partially designed by Nazi scientists and engineers. NASA's director and chief engineer for the Saturn V program were Nazi rocket scientists and engineers ushered into the U.S. without public scrutiny via a secret intelligence program known as Operation Paperclip. Reference 110. Once humans made it to the moon and started walking around on its surface, the first semantically and syntactically complex language they spoke were English words. They didn't just speak any random language. They spoke the Archrolic of a United Kingdom, which had just spent several preceding centuries conquering and colonizing the planet through several aggressive campaigns. To include one which successfully established a beachhead in North America, the place from which the humans who walked on the moon launched. And where did these moonwalkers get the calories they needed to do all that walking and talking on the moon? They got their calories from freeze-dried vegetables grown from fields plowed by the oxen they entrapped and enslaved, freeze-dried beef from the cattle they domesticated and slaughtered over thousands of years. The point is, there are obviously some complex emergent benefits of warfighting when it comes to countervailing the entropy of the universe. The first moonwalkers weren't just our species' top explorers. They were our species' most powerful and aggressive power projectors. In fact, they were arguably life's most powerful and aggressive apex predator. The Apollo campaign was a thinly veiled effort to raise public funding and support for the research and development of the critical, enabling military technology needed to remain strategically competitive with the USSR at a time when public support of the military was at an all-time low. The entire campaign happened during the Vietnam War and a pacifist movement. In the face of growing pacifism caused by discontent of an ongoing war, how do you convince the American public to send lots of public money to newly patriated Nazi scientists and engineers to develop better intercontinental and cis-lunar nuclear missiles? Simple, swap nuclear warheads with astronauts and pump funding into a different marketing strategy, which puts lots of imagery of it on TV with inspiring narratives about peace and exploration. Reference 110. With this simple sleight of hand, a workforce will have little to no reservation devoting substantial amounts of their time, technical talent, and public resources towards the development of strategic military assets. As the author has attempted to demonstrate, all one must do to circumnavigate a domesticated population's negative opinions about warfighting is simply call it something other than warfighting. Call it primordial economics, call it space exploration, or perhaps call it a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. Simply change the branding, and people will have no problem pumping boatloads of money into the same technologies with the same functional use cases with little to no reservation. Look around. We can see similar evidence of the emergent benefits of warfare everywhere. The organizations which master warfare have a clear tendency to become technological and economic leaders and general purpose masters of their natural environment. This is not political dogma. This is an independently verifiable observation backed by 4 billion years worth of empirical data. There is a lot of supporting evidence to feel concerned about populations who condemn warfare and refuse to fight it. We don't need a theory to explain the benefits of warfare. We just need to look around us. Like physical power, warfighting is proof of its own merit. We admire the footprints on the moon left behind those who mastered warfighting. We dig up the mass early graves left behind by those who don't master warfighting. Primordial economics, the survivor's dilemma, and the innovate or die and cooperate or die dynamics of predation are clearly at play for sapiens just as they are for 
all other species. If an intellectually honest reader can acknowledge there's merit to this line of reasoning, then they should understand the argument for why there are very important, complex, emergent social benefits to warfighting, that we have a logical, moral, and most importantly, existential responsibility not to ignore. We must be willing to entertain an uncomfortable but potentially valid hypothesis that wars provide an irreplaceable social and technical benefit to humanity. The self-inflicted stress of predation and global power competitions have clearly made life more prepared to survive and prosper against the universe inflicted stress of entropy. The technical systemic benefits of predation wouldn't change just because sapiens arbitrarily named this primordial behavior war. The dynamics of physical power projection don't change just because sapiens levy abstract thinking to produce moral, ethical, or theological justifications or explanations for it. Morals, ethics, and theologies are not first principles explanations backed by empirical evidence or scientific rigor. A first principles explanation of warfare backed by empirical evidence is that all living organisms physically battle each other over resources and have clearly experienced major systemic benefits from those battles. Like becoming organized, powerful, and resourceful enough to survive devastating existential threats like meteor strikes. Since the emergence of primordial life, the act of living has been fundamentally an act of physical power projection to countervail a cold, harsh, unforgiven, and unwelcoming universe filled with predators and entropy. This didn't change just because sapiens grew overclocked, overpowered, oversized neocortices. Capable of thinking of abstract, imaginary worlds where this isn't incontrovertibly true. The human capacity to believe in unicorns doesn't make unicorns physically real, and neither does the human capacity to believe in peaceful, alternate forms of physical power as a basis for settling disputes and establishing their dominance hierarchy. At least when people choose to believe in unicorns, they don't make themselves systemically vulnerable to foreign invaders or to population-scale systemic exploitation unless you count the unicorn symbolizing the purity and power of the British monarchy. It's simply not logical to believe that sapiens are exemptions to these principles, especially when there is so much empirical evidence backing it. It seems like it would be far harder to make the argument that it was confounding effects, correlation, or pure coincidence that the first Earth in life to walk on the moon were English-speaking Americans riding on top of the missiles they originally developed to kill each other. The much simpler explanation, backed by first principles logic and highly randomized, causally inferable, empirical evidence, is that the same reason Americans were the first to walk on the moon is the same reason lions are ostensibly the king of the jungle. Technically speaking, tigers are the king of the jungle, if you don't include fire-wielding sapiens. Perhaps it is difficult to appreciate the complex emergent benefits of warfare because sapiens desperately want to believe they aren't predators or that they have somehow transcended the cruelties of survival in nature. People like to imagine that they have discovered an equally effective basis for settling disputes, establishing control authority over resources, achieving consensus on the legitimate state of ownership and chain of custody of property, or otherwise just solving the existential imperative all animals face of establishing pecking order limited resources. Ah, that doesn't sound right, but that's what it says. So, infer what you want from it. He probably meant peck in order and control authority over our limited resources that's that's it so what do they do we have already discussed what they do they adopt abstract belief systems where people have imaginary power and then they literally put on costumes and live action role play as people with imaginary power to settle their disputes most pack animals use physical power to settle disputes, establish control authority over resources, and achieve consensus on the legitimate state of ownership and chain of custody of property. This is both an intraspecial and interspecial protocol that is 20 times older than anatomically modern sapiens and 80,000 times older than behaviorally modern sapiens who have tried 
and so far been unsuccessful to create alternative protocols for managing resources which doesn't rely upon physical power. Alternatives which utilize imaginary power and are incontrovertibly and, and demonstrably dysfunctional. Despite how much sapiens wish they could escape the energy expenditure and injury risk associated with warfare, 5,000 years of written testimony plus another 5,000 years of agrarian fossil records indicate sapiens have clearly never found a satisfactory substitute for physical power as the basis for settling disputes and establishing dominance hierarchies. All life forms owe their existence to the process of leveraging physical power to capture and secure their resources. Humans are no different. Humans don't negotiate for their oxygen. They capture it using physical power. Humans don't negotiate for the food they eat. They capture it using physical power and then negotiate with each other over price. Humans don't negotiate for the land they occupy. They capture it from nature using physical power and then negotiate with each other over price. It's incontrovertibly true that living organisms gain and maintain access to their resources using physical power. To live is to project physical power to capture and secure one's control over resources. This isn't something to condemn. It's something to devote oneself to studying and master. Chapter 4.9.11 A sign of peak predation is the hubris to believe that one has transcended the threat of predation. Does natural selection condemn physical power projection as morally, ethically, or theologically bad? No. It does the exact opposite. It asymmetrically rewards this behavior with more resources and the enormous privilege of survival. Take a look around, and the reader will likely note that the only animals condemning the use of physical power to establish intraspecies dominance hierarchies are sapiens. And they're probably not using a technical justification. They're probably using subjective, abstract reasoning, and unfalsifiable claims about good or God. Like Dave Chappelle's fictional character Clayton Bigsby, a passionate member of an anti-African-American hate group who is blind and therefore incapable of seeing he's African-American. Pacifism is comedically ironic. Pacifists turn a blind eye to their own nature. They carry the genes of thousands of generations of predators who scorched the earth and slaughtered their way to the top of the food chain. They are the children of their ancestors' conquest. So comfortable and complacent in their homes, they built over the graves of the conquered that they forgot their own heritage. They forgot they're the colonialists, conquerors, and peak predators benefiting directly from the activity they condemn. It's not surprising why modern domesticated sapiens can develop distorted or misattributed views. Sapiens have become so high in the food chain that many eat thousands of animals without killing a single one. They have mastered predation and killing to a point where they have turned it into a subscription service. They outsource their predation services so effectively that they forget their predators and they get upset, even horrified, when they're reminded about what they're paying for. Modern domesticated sapiens devour their meals sitting in cushioned seats watching mentally cushioned videos of wildlife that has the cruelest and most brutal parts carefully edited out so the video better aligns with their inspiring music and narration given by some guy with an English accent. Sapiens crave stories told by storytellers, especially when they are told by wise old shamans who help them reconcile the mysteries and the cruelty of nature. And they do it all from the comfort of well-insulated, air-conditioned rooms with entrapped and genetically deformed wolves and wildcats licking their feet and worshiping them. Modern domesticated sapiens sincerely and unironically believe they understand nature and have transcended the threat of predation. They genuinely think they have discovered a viable alternative to physical power projection that they outsmarted natural selection. Ironically, there is probably no greater sign of peak predation than the extraordinary amount of hubris required to believe that one has transcended predation. The fact that people get so upset when they are reminded where their stakes come from doubles as proof of their extraordinary success at predation. They prey upon animals without even thinking about it. They scorch the earth, the world, 
colonize it, conquer it, and kill off their competitors so effectively that they forget how they came to own the land they're living on and morally defending in the first place. These same concepts apply to warfare. Sapient populations can become so good at warfare that they develop the hubris to believe they have transcended warfare. This is a common problem in safety system too. Success at safety breeds complacency. As a simple illustration of the point, the reader is invited to study every moral, ethical, or theological argument condemning warfare. Make a list containing the countries of origin from which those arguments were made and then compare that to a list of countries with the most dominant militaries. Don't just do linear regression and see correlations. Do other techniques like propensity score matching to determine if there are causally inferable relationships. Build predictive models on that data and run the model against history and see how accurately it can predict where wars are fought and won. When similar technologies have been tried by anthropologists, they find that their models are strikingly accurate. Several anthropologists have committed themselves to research which causally links the most prosperous, organized, cooperative, resource-abundant societies which enjoy the most amount of art and literature and social freedom to the most warring societies. Reference 22. Chapter 4.9.12 Peace depends on demonstrably flawed assumptions about predatory human behavior. Another way to describe the sapient desire for peace is that it's fundamentally a desire for an end to predation. This desire appears to have spontaneously emerged after our species preyed upon enough neighboring organisms to place ourselves comfortably at the top of the food chain. But is it realistic to expect predation to end? Given the socio-technical benefits outlined thus far, is it even a good idea to desire an end to predation? The innovate or die and cooperate or die dynamics which emerge from predation clearly benefit life's ability to countervail entropy. It's no secret that many of the most revolutionary technologies developed by humankind over the past 10,000 years emerge from their military conflicts against each other. Human on human predation. It is also no secret that the existential threat of warfare motivates sapiens to cooperate at scales which dwarf the levels of cooperation shown by other species. Even if we ignore the systemic benefits of warfighting, it remains true that unrealistic design assumptions must be met for alternative approaches to physical power to function properly as a mechanism to settle sapient disputes, establish control authority over sapient resources, and achieve consensus on the legitimate state of ownership and chain of custody of sapient property. When high levels of sympathy, trust, and cooperation exist within a sapient population, then abstract power hierarchies seem to be able to function nicely as an alternative to warfare. But given a large enough population over a long enough time span, it's hard to believe that these conditions can be permanently satisfied well enough to prevent them from becoming dysfunctional. Consider how much of the population needs to be untrustworthy for modern abstract power hierarchies to become dysfunctional. We can use the United States to serve as a better case scenario of an abstract power hierarchy which has a lot of checks and balances, i.e. logical constraints encoded into rules of law, to logically constrain the exploitation and abuse of abstract power. The United States is one of many presidential republics with a fully independent legislator supposedly capable of preventing the consolidation and abuse of abstract power. But with 535 members of Congress representing the will of 336 million Americans, it would take only a 0.00008% of the United States population, the president plus 51% of its legislature, to be dishonest or incompetent with their imaginary power for the United States to generate into unimpeachable population scale exploitation and abuse of abstract power. The reader is invited to ask themselves how responsible is it to entrust a 0.00008% of the population with abstract power and control authority over the remaining 99.9999%. Combining this observation with the core concepts presented previously, here's another way to frame the same point. 
Because of our desire not to use physical power to establish our dominance hierarchy, people adopt belief systems like presidential republics that can be exploited and abused even when 99.9999% of the population is competent and trustworthy. With the exception of extremely limited but revocable privileges provided to citizens by the Second Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. The U.S. abstract power hierarchy relies on trust in people with imaginary power to manage their resources and keep them secure against high-ranking members of the population wielding enormous asymmetric levels of abstract power and control authority over them that they clearly have incentive to exploit it. 99.9999% of the population must trust that 0.00008% of the population will be clever, competent, and honest enough with their abstract power for the United States Presidential Republic to function properly as a viable substitute for the physical power as the basis for settling their disputes and establishing peck and order over their resources. Again, the U.S. was chosen because it represents a better case scenario. Many abstract power hierarchies would be even easier to systemically exploit than the U.S. Presidential Republic. It is clearly unrealistic to expect 0.00008 of the population to be clever, competent, and trustworthy with abstract power all the time. Most citizens intuitively understand that the imaginary power and control authority we give to our politicians represents a major attack vector which is practically guaranteed to be systemically exploited and abused eventually. Just as 5,000 years of written testimony tells us, they have been exploited and abused in the past. There is a reason why the word politician is often considered to be a pejorative term. Citizens certainly recognize the risk of exploitation and abuse of abstract power. They are simply willing to accept the risk of exploitation and even to tolerate a certain threshold of it, in exchange for not having to expend energy or risk injury settling their disputes, managing their resources, and establishing pecking order using real-world physical power. In other words, we put up with it because we know that fighting to settle our disputes and establish our dominance hierarchies would be time-intensive, energy-intensive, and destructive. We citizens agree to take part in a semi-consensual imaginary structure to give us a temporary reprieve from settling disputes, capturing and securing resources, and establishing peck and order, the way natural selection demands from all species. We put up with the reoccurring flaws and the dysfunctional behavior of our rules of law. We acknowledge the tendency for politicians everywhere, both in our abstract power hierarchies and in our neighbors' abstract power hierarchies, to be untrustworthy with their rank, and we put up with it because we don't want to have to fight each other to settle our disputes and establish our pecking order the way wild animals do. At least subconsciously, it appears that many people seem to intuitively understand how the alternative to abstract power is physical power. Chapter 4.9.13 Peace has only been a temporary reprieve from war, not a permanent replacement to war. Like the lunar eclipse enjoyed by Admiral Columbus, the temporary and fleeting moments of reprieve that sapiens get from the cruelty of predation are both beautiful and awe-inspiring. Unfortunately, both our primordial nature and our written history indicate that these moments are an exception, not a rule. Peace appears to be a reprieve from war, not a replacement for it. Sapiens can be thankful that they get to experience these reprieves on special occasions when exactly the right conditions align in exactly the right way, but it is clearly not reasonable for them to expect it to last forever. We can see that abstract power hierarchies can indeed function properly in a narrow subset of cases, where populations can reasonably expect their ruling class to use their imaginary powers effectively. Sapiens have proven that it's possible to use imaginary power to satisfactorily settle disputes, establish control authority over resources, and achieve consensus on the legitimate state of ownership and chain of custody of their property. They have proven that it's possible to use their imaginations, abstract thinking skills, and design logic to cushion and insulate themselves from a cold, hard reality filled with predators and entropy. They can establish a pecking order in a way that doesn't expend energy or risk injury like physical power does. The problem is, of course, that imaginary power is just that, imaginary. It doesn't physically exist. 
Humans are playing make-believe. They only think they found a viable replacement to physical power as the basis for establishing their dominance hierarchy. The ability to use imaginary power as a surrogate to real power is a story, an inspiring message that people are eager to believe in because it's hard for humans to emotionally reconcile how cold, cruel, and unsympathetic the laws of nature and survivorship truly are. These stories help us mentally escape from what could be the most difficult part of life to reconcile, the fact that we're the cruelest and most unforgiving peak predators of them all. But the reality is undeniable. We're constantly at war. Study enough nature and read enough history and it becomes easy to see why people argue that war is the rule and peace is merely a temporary exception. Crack open a history book or look at a teaspoon of ocean water under a microscope to see evidence of this assertion on your own. Like life itself, agrarian society has always been at war. It has always been projecting physical power to capture and secure access to resources. Society has always been fighting to decentralize control over resources to maximize its chances of survival. Based on what we can independently observe, war appears to be a continuous and cyclical process that takes place because agrarian society has yet to discover a sufficient alternative to settling their disputes, establishing control authority over their resources, and achieving consensus on the legitimate state of ownership and chain of custody of their property. They attempt to use abstract power based dominance hierarchies rather than physical power based dominance hierarchies. But it clearly doesn't work. Our species is continuously fighting on a global scale. It's one of our predominant behaviors.